I got the title for tonight's sermon thinking about a Christmas story that was told by the Walters family. The Walters were, were good, long-time Episcopalians, and Mrs. Walters was one of those women that could cook, like really, really cook. And a couple days before Christmas, she went to the grocery store to make that big pre-Christmas grocery store run. You know, the one where you get all the ingredients for all the meals coming up. Um, except, of course, the ingredient you forget because we live in a fallen world and you won't discover it until Christmas Day. But she got all the other ingredients, you know, groceries upon groceries, just piled in the back of the car. <clears throat> she got everything home. She got the freezer stuff into the freezer, the refrigerator stuff into the refrigerator. She got the dry stuff into the pantry. And then a couple hours later, she came back into the kitchen to make dinner that night. And she opened up the pantry, and it smelled like chicken broth. She hunted around, and she found, to her dismay, that one of the containers of chicken broth had, in the process of being crushed by all the other groceries in the back of the car, developed a very small leak in the corner. And it had been slowly leaking, and then drip, Drip, dripping chicken broth onto the shelf below, right on to the baby Jesus from the family crash. <laughs> now, that's a weird detail. And you may be wondering, Father, why was baby Jesus from the crash in the pantry on the shelf? Well, as I told you, the Walters were good old Episcopalians, and Mrs. Walters was on the altar guild. And she knew that baby Jesus does not go into the nativity scene until Christmas Eve. Here he is, right? But just like our altar guild hides baby Jesus in the narthex until Christmas Eve, Mrs. Walters had taken the baby Jesus from the family crush and put him on the shelf in the pantry where he would stay out of the way and out of sight. The problem was he had just taken a, a chicken broth bath. So she wiped him off as best she could, and she put him up on a higher shelf out of the way to dry out, and then she threw away the container of chicken broth and cleaned up the mess and proceeded to make dinner. And a couple of days later, on Christmas morning, she got up early before anyone else in the house was up, and she put on her flannel robe, and she got up and, and let the dog Elmo out and made coffee and preheated the oven and let the dog Elmo back in, and then she got the baby Jesus down off the shelf, and she put him in the nativity scene, in the stable, in the manger. It was on the low table by the Christmas tree. And um, then she went back to her bedroom with a fresh cup of coffee and finished getting ready for the day. And a couple hours later, as the whole family had gathered and they were opening presents, her four-year-old grandson suddenly asked, Grandma, where you put the baby Jesus? And she said, well, he's right here. And the manger was knocked over, and the baby Jesus was nowhere to be found. And all, all the family denied any involvement or any knowledge in the baby Jesus napping, and they swore they knew nothing. So it was a Walter's family Christmas mystery. Until just about dinner time, when Mr. Walters went to go feed Elmo, and found the bottom third of baby Jesus' leg and a foot <laughs> next to Walter's dinner bowl. Elmo had eaten baby Jesus. <laughs> and it turns out, baby Jesus tastes just like chicken. <laughs> now, years later, and still with some, with some guilt, about like, what happened to her baby Jesus, she told this story to an old retired priest at a holiday party, and, and he listened with a smile, and then he said, Elmo is a profound theologian. <laughs> and she looked at him like, huh? And the priest looked back at her with a twinkle in his eye, and he said, on that first Christmas, the bread of life 
was born in the house of bread and immediately placed on a serving tray. Now think about that for a second. The bread of life, that's Jesus. That's the title he gives himself from the Gospel of John, chapter 6. He says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And then a little later he says, my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. And it is as bread in the Holy Eucharist that most of us most directly and physically encounter Jesus. Yes, in the same Jesus of Christmas night in the manger. So the bread of life was born in the house of bread because that's what Bethlehem means. Bethlehem to us just sounds like a place name, but in Hebrew, Bethlehem is two words. Beit, which is the word for house, and lechem, which is the word for bread. Beit lechem is Bethlehem. It means house of bread. So the bread of life was born in the house of bread, and then immediately the baby was wrapped in bands of cloth and placed in a manger. Manger, M-A-N-G-E-R, is spelled exactly the same way as the French verb manger, which means to eat. Right? And it was the serving tray, it was the feeding trough for the animals in the manger. So the bread of life was born in the house of bread and immediately placed on a serving tray. Listen, friends, God, you know, is God. Like, he doesn't do coincidences. This stuff doesn't happen by chance. Now, don't get all weird about it. Like, you're not supposed to eat the baby. <laughs> Don't eat the baby. But Elmo was on to something, right? And I want, you to, I want you to see and feel clearly tonight that Jesus, from the moment of his birth, from Christmas Eve, the very first one, was given to us for spiritual nourishment and sustenance. The way we encounter Jesus in the bread of the Eucharist was prefigured all the way from his very first night in Bethlehem. He is, as we'll say later at the altar, the gift of God for the people of God. And even the story of his very first hours shows it to be true. And some of you, some of you just need to hear that tonight. You desperately need spiritual sustenance to get you through whatever is going on in your life. So hear it. Christ was born for you. But the newborn bread of life lying in the manger, that's only half of what the angel calls the sign, the proof that the message that the Messiah has been born is true. In verse 12 of our Luke reading, it says, this will be a sign for you, this is the angel speaking to the shepherds. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. So we have the lying in the manger part. But the other half, the wrapped in bands of cloth part, we should, we should not imagine this is the only thing Mary did for baby Jesus that night. Like, she should not just wrap him up and set him down in the manger and let him lie there like a side of smoked salmon on the hors d'oeuvre table at a party, right? Like, surely, surely she bathed him and she held him and she sang to him and she nursed him and she changed him and she wrapped him with bands of cloth. And that became the phrase that in this story symbolizes her loving care for him. And that loving care of Mary for Jesus, that is also a part of the Messiah's coming at Christmas. So we have this twofold sign. We have the swaddling clothes and we have the manger. And in it, we see a twofold love. We see the human love for God in taking care of Jesus. And then we see God's love for us in giving him to us for our spiritual food, for our spiritual life. On Christmas, we remember that God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That, that's the greatest gift. But we also remember that the bread of life drank breast milk. That God's embrace of us invites our embrace of God. Of course, it's true. Jesus grew up, and he sparred with the Pharisees, and he cast out demons, and he healed the sick, and he calmed the storms, and he raised the dead. But as given, 
as given to us. He was so fragile. For Christ to grow strong, he has to be loved. And that is not a statement about Mary's importance to the baby Jesus. That is a statement about your life. For Christ to grow strong, he has to be loved. If you are here tonight, you have been given some little piece of Christ, at least. The deposits made into your account of faith may have been meager. Maybe you were just born into a sort of generically Christian family. Maybe you sporadically attended Sunday school when you were growing up. Maybe you've had moments of prayer, flashes of spiritual awakening, an encounter with a holy person that left you wanting what they had. And yet the flame of faith has never been kindled within you. Maybe you're here tonight and you plan to come back tomorrow, because we have church tomorrow. But you long for the brightness of your passion to match the regularity of your practice. I don't know all the little ways God has given himself to you. But if nothing else, you are here tonight. And you can come forward to this altar rail and we will place a piece of the bread of life the one born in the house of bread and placed on a serving tray, will place a piece of that into your hands. What will you do when God is placed in your hands? It'll only be a little piece. Like a baby just born, that little bit of God will not grow in you unless you love him. Jesus Christ has been given to us to feed, to nourish, to redeem us. He is the bread of life. That is part of what Christmas is all about. But the other thing Christmas is all about is this. If Jesus is to grow big enough in our lives to cast out our demons, to heal our illnesses, to battle our enemies, to calm our storms and raise us from the dead, then we need to love him back in the little, fragile ways he has given to us. Night is Christmas Eve. You are, you are in Christ's church, or you're with us online. From the person you're sitting with, from the music we sing, from the sacrament we share, from God's very presence in this space, you are being given tonight some piece of God's greatest gift. I beg of you, love him, that you may be nourished by him now and evermore be married.